and David, thank you very much for being today here. This is, uh, well, the first session for us for the festival, but also it's a great invitation. Lucia David made us, it felt so natural to uh, get together and uh, celebrate um, audiovisual, celebrate filming, celebrate this way of uh, learning also. Um, today we are in this session, uh, that has a title, it's called From Globalization to a Multiverse of Narratives, um, where Luz and David is going to, uh, they are going to guide us through the session, but first um, Sierra is going to make a small introduction uh, from, from them, for them. And uh, well, welcome very much to this uh, last Gutisan session too, together today with Luz and David. <laughs> Thanks, Camilo. I'm feeling so excited about this final session. It feels, yeah, just like a perfect way to end. Um, we'll almost end the conference and um, the, yeah, the film festival, which has been kind of like embedded within the conference this year. Um, so really happy to, yeah, again, welcome Luz and David into this space. Thank you for offering. And then we have all these amazing also panelists that they've collected. Uh, for the session too. So I'm really excited. I don't know what's going to happen, but I'm really excited to like just participate and, um, and yeah, um, enjoy the film and the conversation. Um, I'm going to uh, throw into the chat the um, the link to the, the film festival. Um, so there's actually 15 films that have been have formed part of the festival. Um, mm -hmm. So each session has have highlighted different films and different producers. Um, and we didn't watch any of the films because they're quite long and there's a lot of them, but I'll leave, drop that there for anybody who wants to check it out later. Um, they're amazing um, and very varied and um, yeah, there's just like a lot there. Um, we encourage people to like, form, make your own little mini film festivals at home with your friends and, and watch. <laughs> And then let us know what you thought. <laughs> um, but yeah, so for now, thank you so much for being here. Um, Luz and David, our dear friends. Um, yeah, we've been kind of crossing paths for quite a few years now, it feels like. And um, they're incredible filmmakers that I really admire also very much. Um, and um, yeah, I'm really excited to welcome them. Now they're founders of Evolving Education, which is um, um, a project whose mission is to research and democratize how the most progressive learning spaces around the planet are transforming education. Um, in their journey, they've become aware of the deep need to reroute education to allow life to flourish. Um, and, and yeah, they've traveled around the world and been to so many spaces and talked to so many educators and have documented it on the way. And so it's a huge gift to be able to, um, yeah, receive um, part of what they've created with and to, to see it and to share it and to um yeah get to learn along with them so with that pass it over to you Lisa and David welcome thank you so much for being thank you very much uh, for the presentation uh, and Camila <laughs> and congratulations for organizing the, this film festival within university I think that films are an amazing way to to share so much knowledge and using stories um in a in a way that I think many people are able to connect with them in a concise way even though there's so much work that goes into it I'm, I'm always amazed with the with these short documentary films that it's like Oh, it's just 10 minutes, but it's like, how long did it take you to produce <laughs> this? Ah, it's just three years. years. <laughs> <laughs> so, so yeah, there's a lot of work that goes into it. And, in, and thank you for creating the space to, to make it possible to share it and to have conversations. Because I think for us, um, it's never been just about releasing a film. Actually, you cannot find them online. It's been about the conversations that um, are that we good. have uh, after the, watching them. Mm -hmm. Yeah triggers to start conversations yeah. that maybe people don't want to talk about, but we need to talk about. And, <laughs> yeah. So yeah, um, Luz and David here. Um, let me let me start a little bit. Like the, the question that kind of follow me like during my whole life, it was like, what is your passion? When, when I started studying and so on, I studied biotechnology. Then I went to work into um, biotech for for many years actually and all the time that question was there like what is your passion is this really your passion like being in the in the lab moving things around and doing experiments and 
it wasn't. Every time I could, I was escaping somewhere in the middle of, of yeah, of whatever, just to to be with children and to and to yeah, learn from them. Uh, but however, that was completely against the idea of success that the world or yeah, I learned in my in my schooling. Like I was supposed to go to uh, the school, then high school, then university, then get a super good job, then get a better job, then get a house, then kids, and so on. So that like, the idea of success was really clear to me, uh, and it was super hard to actually question that. But that question, the what is your passion, was like okay, I cannot keep ignoring it. Obviously, every time I can, I go. Um, with spaces with kids and I really enjoy learning with them and when I started doing that I realized that education is key to change the world like if you want if we really want to transform and create a better uh, present we need to work with kids so they start doing it while they are mm -hmm. young so that it's kind of how everything started like there was these triggers in my life that were pushing me to leave science I, I left it and then um yeah, kind of jump to the unknown. And then is when I did my master, like obviously you have to study to be a teacher. So I was like, okay, I'll do my master to be a teacher. And then the methodologies that were, they were teaching me was like, oh my God, wait a second. It seems that they haven't evolved a lot in 200 years. Like the way they were teaching me was exactly the, the same way that, yeah, that I learned. And it was like, but it hasn't prepared me to, to actually live life fully. So yeah, I felt like th there should be different ways. Um, so I started reading and doing my thesis into innovative methodologies in education. And then it's where I realized that there were many different schools trying things in a completely different way. And they were actually teaching kids to, co uh, to be self-confident, to respect their creativity. And it was a, wow, this is completely amazing. I have to, I have to do this. I have to be a teacher and um, allow kids to flourish. And then I started and it was like, fantastic, I'll do it. And pretty much I translated what it was in the book into the, a PowerPoint presentation and it didn't work like that. <laughs> so it was like, okay, this is, this is actually way harder to, to translate that theory so beautiful I have read into the practice. So that is where, where the journey, well, not the journey, but where, where evolving education started. I, I told that we, what if we start a trip with a camera going and visiting all these innovative schools interviewing teachers and students and facilitators and get to learn how they do things in a completely different way and he was crazy enough to to follow me <laughs> well you didn't leave me many options i must say <laughs> it's like i'm living with or without you so, so I, had to, I had to say yes <laughs> Uh, but but it's been it's been really a transformational experience. I think that, um, our lives ourselves we have never been the same after all of this. Um, we have changed the way that, that we eat, the way that we consume things, the way that we relate with people, and definitely the way that we see learning and education. Uh, we have explored the world of alternative, innovative, transformational education, all the way from. Um, I don't know, project based learning that they do in a very expensive elitist school to a communities of families that meet in a forest to do activities connected with nature and that live through a reforestation project going through uh, democratic education, sociocratic, agile learning centers, really a wide diversity of things in between. Um, and two things that, that really impacted us or that I think two core learnings in, in these adventures have been the first one is the, the potential of transferring the responsibility of learning from the educators to the actual learners so that they, they can develop some key life skills, essential skills for their life, like self-esteem, empathy, critical thinking. They're able to identify and follow their passions through. And also they are the question, the world that we live in and start making more conscious decisions about how we want to create or regenerate actually um, communities and, and nature. And the other core uh, shock that we had in, in many places around the world, uh, including India and Mexico, where we live at the moment, is that education had been used as a force for colonization, as a force for change how people think and live um, and express themselves, the, change the whole language in many cases, like, like in the country that we're in the moment. 
uh, and this still continues today, by the way. Uh, I just heard um, a crazy story <laughs> two days ago. Maybe I can share it later. But for now, uh, uh, let's do may maybe just uh, sharing a little bit about what we do now after this whole amazing experience. We were we were shocked. We we didn't want to keep this collective wisdom just for us, but so we started looking for ways to communicate this to share it. So we have done a variety of things, such as developing uh, some short documentary films. We're actually doing a, a feature film. That's why the video we're gonna just release it in the chat, so you can watch it, and, and then we can have a conversation. But it's not gonna be left on the website because we want to go to film festivals, and and you cannot um, have it out there, and so on. Uh, also, uh, uh, an ebook that I'm gonna put over here, uh, so you can you have the link. You can download it. It's called Questioning Education, and we question what's the objective of education, whether it is to to pass exams, to go to higher uh, education and keep on pro uh, progressing, uh, whether it is to question society, to, whether it is to develop um, 21st century skills, and how different learning spaces around the world are responding to that those different objectives for education. Mm -hmm. And the other one is to support people that want to be part of that transformation of education towards more just and equitable models. And, mostly about empowering youth to take control of the learning through a learning experience such as the learning expedition where puja is actually one of the people that are joining us in the current edition um, and it's great to have you here puja um, so without more ado i think we're gonna go ahead and share with you the link for the video it's on youtube uh it's it's kind of on this uh mode where only the people with the link can watch it at the moment. Um, you can activate the subtitles to have them in English. That's, that's a lot of Spanish in there. Mm -hmm. uh, it's about 15 minutes, so yep. we'll watch it, each of us, independently. Um, and in 15 minutes, we'll be back to have a conversation um, about how education has been used for a force of uh, colonization and what can we do about it. And we have a couple of people here, Zoe and, and Archena, who we invited as well to, to share a little bit of their, their vision and, and their stories connected with this in two different places of the world. And, and we think that this can be very enriching for us. So see you in 15 minutes then. Yes. Cuando somos niños, nuestras mentes son una tabula rasa. Poco a poco, vamos creciendo y vemos el mundo a través de las lentes de nuestra familia, de nuestra cultura, de nuestra educación. Viajando, me doy cuenta. Yeah. Yeah, just so a... sorry, I didn't realize that was happening. Ah. Okay, I love the echo effect for a while. <laughs> Sorry, sorry. I hope I can come to the party in the end. I was wondering where I'm hearing double Definitely. voices. I, like, I must tell David that it's coming twice yeah. in the video. <laughs> yep. Now. Okay, back to it then. You guys got to meet Gustavo in person. Yeah. Which year was this? Uh, I was maybe two years ago. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, it was one of those um, learnings that really stayed really deeply with us. Uh, that's why we were trying to share it in as many places. He's as amazing. He's amazing. All right, so I think uh, more or less people got those 15 minutes to watch the, um, the film. Let's see if they, they're coming back. So the, the way that we thought of structuring this, uh, this time that we're going to have together is to, um, we're going to have time for everyone to share the reflections and questions and so on. But maybe before that, since we have uh, two people we have got a, a dog here that's trying to be part of the 
screening. <laughs> uh, but but first of all, we would like to to invite Archana and and Zoe. Um, uh, since we know that they are doing projects that are revealing their local cultures and that are questioning education as a force for colonization. So um, we wanted to, to invite them to share a little bit about their own stories as well uh, to make this kind of um, live uh, learning. We have already learned a little bit in that, in that uh, short film. So now I, I wanted to open the floor for Archana and Zoe to, to tell us a bit about yourself, your journey on education, and maybe if you can share with us what um, decolonizing education means for you. Zoe, would you like to go first? I'm just getting some bouts of cough, so I'm just going to quickly have some water and come back. <laughs> <laughs> okay thank you for the introduction it made me very very happy and I'm still kind of overcome emotionally by the beautiful film that you've made um, <clears throat> so I'm still <laughs> I'm still coming back. Well done, and thank you for that incredible uh, work. And I really look forward to seeing where you're taking it. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm gonna put in the chat some links to the work that I'm doing. <clears throat> uh, most of it is collaborative so I'm representing groups unfortunately very very small groups um, I'm in Kofu which is an island in Greece and in case you don't know the situation in Greece is uh, incredibly restrictive in terms of choice the freedom of choice, the human right, the legal right to choice in education. <clears throat> so the groups that I'm representing are very small and very weak, mostly due to this. Um, <clears throat> I'm also adding a presentation of where all this started for me. So my background is dance and dance therapy, dance movement therapy. And um, in the past 25 years, it became clear to me that neurological programming, so what somebody in your film called behavioral brainwashing, behavior brainwashing <clears throat> is a huge part of the problem. So my work is a lot about um, creating situations where biological self-awareness, so neurological awareness of self um, can be freed from all of the restrictions that colonialism and whatever restricts that. If we look at it, it, it all boils down to colonialism in the end, but um, to, to free the neurology from those restrictions. <clears throat> so that practice, my practice is called Ensoma. Um, I've been busy with setting up uh, education reform projects in Greece for the past 15 years, um, always in collaboration with the international community because it became very clear that as a very small country, which has been uh, colonialized in very 
different ways from the ones that um, probably come up on the map with red flashing signs. Um, it's, it's, it's absolutely imperative that we stay in connection with the international community. But the, the little projects that we've made are, are designed to reinforce each other and constantly building these global relationships. <clears throat> so one of them is the Spring Academy. Um, its aim is to, to, to be a, a, a learning community without borders. Um, and another is, they're all interconnected, as, as I said, so <clears throat> the free to learn community is, is also one, um, where we're trying to build, uh, again, a community without borders, which is focused on uh, protecting the freedom to choose an education for everybody. Um, and what I've, what decolonialization is for me, what I've noticed um, is that no matter how different the colonialization processes uh, are, the effect that stands out for me most of all is this behavior brainwashing where the instinct to stick together is gone. The natural ability for alliance is gone. In some cases, not even faded or weak. It's actually not there. So for me, for example, during the pandemic, it became striking, sometimes terrifying to see how as a global community, we seem to have lost the instinct to protect our young. And uh, the dividing lines between human and everything not human, everything else, the dividing lines between ages, uh, the, divide, the dividing lines between uh, geographical, political borders, socioeconomic uh, groups and communities just become stronger and stronger all the way to dividing individuals from their own ecology, individuals from each other and communities from each other. And so um, any kind of resistance to um, coloniali colonialization and the, the normalization of it where, where you get to the point where you don't even notice it or question it or feel it anymore. Um, lost my train of thought there. Uh, there was another bit to that sentence, but anyway, so um, maybe that's enough for now. From Thank, me. You. Thank you. Thank you. Well, there was a, there were lots of super deep conclusions that you, you just throw up there, but uh, but I I understand how long it takes for a person to really internalize the things that you you have you have just mentioned very quickly like the journey that each of us need to make to understand the the implications of of that change in society and how much it affects us as human beings as as communities in our connection with nature mm -hmm. and and for the world that we're building together uh, which is completely different path than the the mainstream direction um, mm -hmm. but, but let's keep let's keep maybe learning about um, this concept of um, the colonial education. Uh, but first, to get to know a bit more about Archana, who have, I'm lucky enough to have the chance to collaborate uh, within the one of the Ecoversity circle. So Archana, I'm really <laughs> I'm really looking forward to know all your life in and out. So. <laughs> <laughs> Too much. <laughs> I'm going to apologize in case if I start coughing. I'm recovering from a flu, a really bad flu. 
and uh, thank you so much. Um, I really love the video you guys have created and it really clearly shows the, the diversity and the dimensions that you have managed to capture. And of course, you have one of the people that most of us revere here very deeply, Gustavo. We lost him last year. And I still remember that we did have some kind of a ceremony around the Ecoversities gathering last year for him. So yeah, just to listen to him suddenly in your film was like, wow, okay, he's here, you know? And that's the reason I asked you, when was this, you know? And when did you do that? So um, my life has been, I think, uh, all over the place. I'm armed forces kid. I'm based in India. I was born in one city, brought up in multiple cities, never stayed in one place. It was a good thing because you got, India being such a diverse country, you also get exposed to so many diverse cultures, right? And as a kid, you latch on to whatever is there with you. So you have that milk lady who would come to give you milk in the morning. So you start talking to her in her language. And you have some people coming to work in your home and you start talking to them in their language. And as a child, you don't have these filters and you just learn, right? And the the number of languages that one has the capacity to pick at that age is phenomenal. But how that entire thing starts getting, you know, put aside as irrelevant, it starts very early in your life. And because your school does not recognize that language can be a potential skill and your window to the world to learn about so much more and through so many different lenses. Uh, and I think my questioning started very early in life when I was 10 years old. And I was a very irritating child in most of the education institutions I went to. My teachers never liked me because I asked uncomfortable question and nobody knew how to shut me up uh, because I had an equally crazy brother and who always told me to speak my mind. So on one, on one side of my parents told me that, oh, behave. My brother said, go ahead and do what you want, you know. <laughs> so I, I had... Uh, a crazy example in my life to begin with um, but it did give me a very very different world view otherwise being in a space when I did not have the kind of uh, knowledge at the disposal that the younger generation has today we did not have so much right we really had to seek these things out and we learned everything by mistakes we learned everything by trial and error we learned everything by experiences and we questioned and those questions were never answered we were always shushed because we were kids right and that shushing did not work more questions came so i finally walked out of my graduation i just could not finish it because i just could not take the the stupidity of it all and I saw that my professors were not interested in really teaching what they were teaching, but it was just uh, getting by the motions. And I like if I, and I wanted to do philosophy and psychology and my college refused to give me that saying that you're the only person demanding such kind of subjects, you know, so we can't create this kind of space for you. And being an armed forces kid, I had limited exposure to where I could go. So I was trapped in a system which did not want to entertain me because I was asking for something unique, which they were not ready to provide. Right. And as a result, I was taken, those choices were taken away from me. And I'm like, why should I go with the design notion of an adult who doesn't even understand my interests? And why should I just follow that blindly? Right. And what purpose does it serve? Does it serve the purpose of somebody to say that, oh, I've got a graduate or a master's person working for me, you know, who's a, who's a genius and a brilliant. I like, I would rather, you know, come across as a dumb and daft person who never went through the college and it's okay with me kind of a thing so I think I started reading voraciously my entire learning was from my books whatever I could find wherever I could find right internet was not the biggest thing at that time and dial-in connections were not the most reliable so it was crazy and uh, yeah and that is where the journey began and the more I traveled I was I'm a mountaineer the more I traveled the more I was in the mountains the more I saw the way people just lived joyfully, uh, very intelligently, I would say. And the simplicity of what, like it looked simple, but I think it, they overcame the most complex things in a day, right? Because it was happening every single day. And the kids in the mountain, mountain, these mountain communities, 
were very adaptable to these things before we started pushing them into schools, before government decided everybody needs to go to school. And now those children have lost the ability, which came as natural instincts to them because of the privilege of being in the homes and, and with the families that they were designed to be with. So I think that journey started from there. And I'm in the Eastern Himalayas now in India. I work very closely with three of the prominent tribes across three states over here. Uh, this current state I'm in is called Meghalaya. And we have three primary tribes over here. The biggest one of them is the Khasi people. They are more popularly known for the living roots bridges that they make. So they basically weave the roots of these bridges and they uh, of the, this particular tree and they make bridges across 30 years, three generations, uh, th three decades, right? And the belief is that if you find a living root bridge in any of these forests, that means that community has been together at least for two to three generations because no one person can make this bridge. And as in when somebody is passing by that place, they will see one root is just moving out and they will go put it right in, right? And that is the beautiful belief that the whole community has. And the, the challenge was that a lot of middle, younger generation was moving away from community. So you had very elderly people, and then you had a very younger generation in these community. And I ex experienced that not just in India, but I experienced that in Nepal when I was there for search and rescue post the earthquake, that there was no middle, uh, you know, adult community that, there because they had all moved away in, in search for a better life or job or providing better things to their family. And they couldn't come back in such kind of times as well. And that was such a sad thing, right? So what could we do to create this sustainable ecosystem that does not take you away from family, but allows you to also have a life that you dream and visualize of? Again, what is that narrative of life? Is it that life that somebody has shown you from a very different lens who just came to visit you once? Or do you understand the importance of what you already have? And what is the treasure trove that you are living with, right? So I got down to talking to the Khasi people in Meghalaya, then we have the Karbi people in Assam. They are, again, one of the largest tribe, but they are struggling for their identity between two of the state run and then another extremist group who wants to just pull them apart in their own thing. And they want to maintain their identity. So they approached me and they're like, Archana, can we create something like this over here? So I'm like, of course we can. So at the end of the day, I realized that each culture has so much to offer, which is so unique to itself, to its own children, that can be create a structure which is replicable everywhere. And then it can be customized by the people, co-created with the community, and it can be led by the community over a period of time. So our intention is that give it three to five years, co-create the whole process with the community. So I'll give you an example. Right now, we have got a land that has been identified we have got three pockets of land that the community has come forward with, and it's anywhere between 20 to 25 acres of land. It will be a residential learning space that they have identified, and they are going to identify how many young people from their community would become the facilitator in this whole process who are interested in it. And over a period of time, we want more people to rise up to different, different things. So our job is just to keep providing them with options, knowledge, networks, well, how would they visualize this whole thing? And plus, including the elders and the clan leaders of the community, you know? And that is the beauty of it, to see what is emerging. Uh, where is it? I'm so sorry, Zoe, but I will, I'm putting things together. I would be very happy to share it. I'm very horrible with documentation. <laughs> One thing I need to learn. <laughs> Please teach me filmmaking. Um, so, <laughs> um, so at the end of the day, that is what we are doing. Now we have a nine month plan laid out and the community has these beautiful belief system that they said, you know, we are dreaming this beautiful dream. Let's dream it on the land. Let the land listen to what we are dreaming for it, you know, so that it nurtures itself and prepares itself for receiving this thing with all of us. We have sacred forests, which you are not allowed to take anything out of. This is like deep belief of these community and practices. So we are looking at how our traditional value can be something that guides the younger generation into being rooted, into having these beautiful skill and wisdom. But at the same time, can their knowledge become contextual with regard to the world? so that they don't feel isolated uh, in context of what's happening around them, right? Can they make sense? Mm -hmm. And Zoya, what, uh, Zoya, I'm saying, sorry. Um, Luz, I really love what you said about that. What is it that I don't know? And that has been lost because of this deep conditioning of my ancestors. 
because of the colonization of my ancestors, right? There is so much of knowledge that is lost already. So I think one of the things that we are working on is that how can we shift the narratives back? And at the same time, what I really liked in the previous session was what Ashish said from the global tapestry of alternatives that maybe we need to figure out hybrid models of the old belief system, the new belief system, and find the right balances in the whole space, right? So this is what we are working on uh, over here. Uh, we are also working in a conflict zone in Kashmir. And that is where we keep getting calls for because there's a need for this. They're like, we don't want our children to be shot just because they're going to an education space. So can you create something in our community? I'm like, of course we can, you know? So at the end of the day, we want to ensure that the community wants to do this because without their participation, no matter what I dream and visualize for this world, it is just a dream, you know? And it can't, I can't take it forward everywhere. So we, we want them to be an equal participant and probably the leaders in this. So that's important. Decolonization for me means, yeah, shifting of these narratives, challenging my own, challenging my own judgment, because I recognize that I have been brought up by deeply conditioned parents, by deeply conditioned ecosystem of knowledge, education, peer community, which is still deeply influenced by what it sees around them. So I think for me, it is about what can I do today that you know, where I can truly live within my own essence of what freedom means to me and what free approaches towards that is. So for me, one day at a time and moving in that direction works a lot. I've never been somebody because I like, I don't know if I'll be alive two weeks down the line. And uh, so I would focus on today. And that is the wisdom I would share with everybody today, whatever I can know. So that is where I am uh, right now. You all are welcome to India. We will start building the process, uh, the whole space in September, October, because monsoons have already arrived. So we are going to start planting everything. And so that the indigenous trees, the, the greenery, everything finds root. And at the same time, the indigenous people are going to set rocks in places that they want to build these spaces so that the rocks also enter the heart of the earth, you know, so they get grounded. So I'm telling you, there's such beautiful practices I learn every day. And uh, I think it is my re-education and uh, um, I'm learning all over again. And I find it such a blessing to be able to learn from diverse cultures where I'm based in, in the Eastern Himalayas. So it's an open invitation to everybody on this panel. Please come. <laughs> That's wow. what I am. Thank you so much. Amazing. And, and, you, and you touch on something that I, I think it's a, it's a, it's a core place of, a kind of conflict within myself and in conversation is how to find that balance, right? Because uh, um, because on one hand, it's, it's like uh, we want to revalue local cultures, we need to allow people to live in, in their traditional ways. And on the other hand, is the, the world uh, as a whole is changing a lot uh, and it's influencing them in many different ways. So how, how to balance those two balance. things? We don't grow up isolated from uh, the developments in society that we cannot control, but also we are not controlled by that. And, and there's, it, it seems that there's a single path that we all need to walk through. Curious. I would love to just uh, share this picture very, very quickly. I'm sorry, Luz, I know I interrupted you. No, 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 it no. will show you the what a living root is. So this is the living root. And you can see these children wow. who are sitting on the living root right now. and. Uh, you know, these, this particular entire thing had, so they, you will find these living root bridges all across the Khasi community. There are 171 villages and you will always find them next to some or the other community because it's a community practice, right? You also find sacred forests, uh, which are deeply revered. So anytime that you have an intention for the community, for anyone in the community, you actually go and offer prayers to the deities in these sacred forests. And you should not take anything out of the forest, not even a leaf. Apparently it brings a lot of, uh, yeah, nightmares. But at the same time, bad things happen apparently. <laughs> so <laughs> they made me like dust myself when I went inside the sacred forest and I came back. But um, there is a whole culture, there's a whole belief system and everything, you know, that is around there. So these kids are there. And uh, yeah, these kids are the future living roots, uh, <laughs> elders uh, that we basically say. So I just wanted to share so you get an idea as to what it looks like, no? And uh, these are just you know, emeralds in the in deep in the forest, you don't know otherwise about them anywhere that way. Mm -hmm. Thank mm -hmm. you. Sorry, Liz. No, no, don't worry. <laughs>
Yeah, I was just gonna say to what David was saying is the the questioning part of, yeah, like, I guess that is super hard because I, I was thinking about the, what the movie says about the ancestors and you just mentioned, it was like, well, actually now thinking a little bit deeply, like sometimes I'm not even able to respect my own needs. Like there are some parts in that, through that schooling that, that I have learned some things that actually don't respect my own needs. Like I, it's really like not so long ago that I started moving and dancing. Like before I was really ashamed of doing that. And however, now it's like, wow, I don't know how I have survived without moving. Like I, it's kind of my meditation way of doing things. However, that hasn't, that wasn't like, normal uh so so i was thinking on that on actually or honoring your own needs and in that part it's like okay you have to question the things that you see question your practices too and then finding what actually what actually honors your inner self and your beliefs and how you want to be mm -hmm. so but that's really hard <laughs> because there is a lot of questioning and obviously there is not like like maybe we make a lot of mistakes along that process and that's okay we can mm -hmm. keep in depending on those, those mistakes and how do they feel we can start like going from one side to the other and finding our own path mm -hmm. and there's not gonna be like the balance is always gonna be moving it's not gonna be there's not gonna be a moment that states mm -hmm. like okay now it's in equilibrium no mm -hmm. it's gonna be like all the time more mm -hmm. around. And, and that's the beauty i guess also of that process yeah like yeah and do you want to go to the next question i have some things but i think uh, that it can no if, if you want i was thinking that given that we have one hour and a half and we have been one hour already kind of one directional like uh, either Luz yeah. and i or, or the panelists that we invited we have been talking to the rest of the people just to ensure that we allow enough time for anyone that also wants to share their own reflections questions whether whether about the film or whether about what Zoe and Arsena has been sharing with us feel free to uh, raise the emoticon of the hand if you would like to contribute somehow yeah Michelle Yeah, thank you all. And actually, lovely to hear your story. Ashna and I sit in lots of meetings. <laughs> I'm realizing, oh, I'm hearing Ashna's um, story for the, oh yeah, her, for the first time. So thank you, and thank you for this film. I I I want to say that um, for me, it just um, I, I guess uh, brings or makes one see possibilities of pluriverse and diversity and and so so I'm in Cape Town in South Africa and still sort of at the university and and in a moment of having to have these difficult conversations with many of my climate change science colleagues um, who use words like oh this uh, you know we need more skills to uh, address this problem and 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 so sometimes, and I was saying in a session yesterday, I feel a bit lonely at the university. Um, uh, yeah, I don't have a tribe, <laughs> as in, you know, so, and uh, and if I raise uh, a questions about women that I've spoken to in my own re work and research around questioning renewable energy transitions. Um, many of the women knew a lot about soil and cultivation and yeah, relationality. And I would say, but there's a lot of skills there of understanding relationships with the soil. And so when I was looking at Ashina's the the bridges and, and you know to build those bridges and hold them together, and but I'm I'm just I guess and we spoke about balance here, but I I guess I'm asking for some thoughts or ideas is. Um, opening this conversations, um, you know, in spaces where people cannot see, or maybe they're not willing, or maybe they don't know. Um, so, just some of your thoughts and on, I guess, you know, how to open the pluriverse conversation in narrow spaces at the moment, like the universities. Hmm. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I just want to say, oh, should I shoot? You know, like, I'm just thinking, should I be putting my energies there or should I be putting it with the communities working in the cracks? And, you know, but I think, and then I think, and then my fear is at the same time, 
I still need a little bit of income or money. But yeah, so, you know, so one's in this kind of, I don't know, dilemmas. So, yeah, and how to put, where to put your energies and navigate this complex spaces. Uh, and I wanted to share a story uh, allowing Arsenal to think of it because it's like a very complicated question, I think, um, that just two days ago, uh, it was it related with university. And we were in a, in a, in a congress about higher education change making. And we were talking uh, over, over a dinner with one of the um, uh, professors in, in social innovation. And she was really focused on how to support people in Ecuador, in this case, uh, to, to be more resilient, to have a better life. And, and she was telling us some of the ways in which she was doing that. And, and she was saying, well, there are these communities in the, in the Amazons that they don't know how to read, how to write. So we need to help them to, to get there. So we're getting funding from big mining companies that they are, they are sponsoring this program where we go there to, to teach them and to help them to, to know more. And we're also bringing their entrepreneurship program. So they are setting up uh, the roads and the shops and the hotels and everything. And the final picture was like, so pretty much you're paving the way for uh, transforming this local community into a place that is completely receptive to the mining company to come and exploit their 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 homes uh, because they now have a completely built up infrastructure and, and mindset to look for for money and to be selling services and products to these people that come from outside with that money to pay for them and so now they don't have to set up their own hotels or anything else because now the local people have already built them for them and are already providing the food and and everything um and as as we were talking like uh the community um uh, feeling the the connection with nature, all of those things get lost. The more the more we move away towards development, um, and and now uh, and as I was saying, I mean, I I truly believe that she was doing this with uh, her whole best intention, and thinking that this is was a way to support the people that they they, they were helping them to come out of poverty, uh, to uh, to be able to read out of the internet any information that they wanted to because now they they knew spanish which is a main language to access lots of information so there's a lot of good willingness behind these actions but uh, there's a massive gap from uh, and she was like a bit dubious about should i accept this funding from these companies because i know that their final aim is obviously to go and mine in in the amazon and precisely in the communities that they are finding this project uh, but I believe that we're using that funding for something positive. I believe that we are helping them uh, to live a better life. And I think there is the, that big challenge for, uh, that Archana was mentioning before of that hybrid of um, uh, obviously lots of people can benefit from accessing, having access to information or being able to communicate with other people in a common language. But uh, everything has a cost, like uh, everything that you introduce has a, an, a an, an consequence that in many cases we might not be able to understand like how and obviously all of this uh, i think is related as well to the things that we can measure like we can measure the number of kids and how to read we can measure the number of companies that are set up we can measure infrastructure roads we can measure all those things we can measure community uh, we can measure uh, relationality with nature um yeah the, the, we cannot measure family ties uh, and so we don't we don't value those things as much as the things that we can measure. Mm -hmm. Thank so, you. Yeah. Um, first of all, I empathize sympathize with the loneliness, and I think it's a very important issue. And healing, responding to that loneliness, I think, is. Uh, very important element of the decolonialization intention. Um, and Michelle, I don't think you were in the previous session uh, where we spoke about how uh, the narratives and the terms and and the the whole um, the academics of of decolonial 
decolonialization are actually being appropriated by the systems that are perpetuating, are reinforcing and normalizing uh, colonialization. So uh, I've spent, I've invested a lot of time looking for, for groups and communities and organizations <clears throat> that can help with the kind of loneliness and therefore ineffectiveness of our work that I think you're describing within universities and other such contexts where the, the thing, the institution itself is designed to disempower and appropriate any kind of attempt, any kind of such attempt. Um, and I found, if, if this is helpful, that Ecoversities and the Alliance is actually um, the place where any anything like this, like what you're maybe asking for, can happen, if that's helpful. There's many organizations that pr uh, promise it, but they're doing they're doing something strange, and that's not happening here. Thanks, thanks. I, and I, I want to say finding ecoversities through a, a student, one of my students in 2020 um ha, yeah has been that place and so I, and 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 ecoversities is coming to cape town which I, yeah i'm looking very forward to <laughs> um but and i feel that in a way you know it might there might be some catalysts or yeah some things to to ignite things well yeah so so thanks yeah i definitely feel that um I have community here. <laughs> so. I would like to add there. I think like to answer to your question, Michelle, it's super hard to convince people that don't want to be convinced. Like, and also speaking about progress and success, like those are definitions that like, Precisely the, the definition of success is something that actually we assume that is something, but we need to figure out which one is our definition. And but then other things like progress, it seems that it's super good, but what does progress cost to the people that is in that community? So starting to have conversations is, is one thing. Like you can use different triggers, movies, um prepare some dialogue so people can speak around it. Those are good ideas to, to start a conversation, but it's, I think that is super tiring also. Like you cannot like try to convince because it's not gonna work. Like you cannot convince people that it has to come from their curiosity and their willingness to learn. And then maybe creating those environments, it's super cool. Like instead of creating a debate, create a dialogue because the debate is gonna make people polarized. One is gonna defend one thing and the other is gonna defend the other thing. But then if, if, if you just have questions, so people start talking around it without not a correct answer, but just at a space of wondering, can be can be a thing that you do but definitely like i will say it's super tiring to yeah like to have the minds that you have to change people that's mm -hmm. super hard you cannot do it you can just be a role model and work on yourself um and precisely if you have those conversations with many people have that thrive that is supporting you because it's super tight <laughs> yep uh, camilo I have a question. Those yeah. kinds of yeah. um, um, well, uh, about decolonies, decolonizing audiovisuals, because we've been like in these three sessions before uh, this fourth of the of the festival. We've um, we've been having lots of questions, as you said, like having these discussions. This other ways of uh, also watching, you know, that, that, uh, that's why I think we were also very, very welcome to this conversation with you inside the film, the film because it was to uh, watch a film together. And as you said, no, this is not for lots of uses to get together and then dialogue, have a dialogue. It's another way of watching, you know? So how do, how we can evolve 
education films, something like that. How they, how, how is, uh, how, how can we make audiovisuals to be seen and, and done also, but seen and uh, watched and um, multiply, you know, in that way, the dimensions of, uh, of dialogue. Um, and uh, yeah, that, that, that could be the, uh, like a good question I'm, I'm having right now, because it has been very, very nice, very beautiful um, to watch together, for example, and as uh, we are inviting with Sierra, go to the, see all the films, but try to do it together also. That's the idea of the, the film, not to uh, consume fast, not to uh, forget very easy and go to the next, you know, as maybe there's other uh, capitalistic or whatever cinema no. way of watching, you know, no. you just like to stay and uh, evolve image, I don't know. That's, uh, absolutely, Camila, and I think that you touched really on, on, I think it's the purpose of why you're making that film, right? Uh, so in our case, it was to have this conversation, it was to, um, what Michelle was talking about, was to reflect about a concept that is really complicated. There are many different views and that we didn't even feel prepared to talk about colonialism in education uh like i i don't feel i'm a representative of the topic to be able to tell to other people but uh, i i felt that we had listened to many other people and it was a way to how to condense this because uh, we're like the best bits of different people build a story including the emotions the storytelling making it compelling so that it has that trigger point to then being able to have a conversation um, and bring it to uh, each person's context. So what my, Michelle was saying um, about how to, I, I, I wouldn't say how to convince people, but how to start the conversations. I think audiovisuals and short films can be, or, or documentary films in general can be a great way because they already present very nicely, lots of data, lots of information that each of, each of those people have been putting together. And then having some questions to, hold, uh, to host a, a dialogue. And this is something that we have done in different schools, in education congresses that are not necessarily aligned with the vision of the universities, <laughs> finding very, very challenging ourselves in very challenging situations. But we found that by not being us who are delivering the message, but by bringing these other visuals, then it's like, hey, there's like 20 people there in that film in, in six different countries that seem to be aligned about this message. So I understand that you don't agree, but there seems to be something relevant that we need to talk about uh, in here. Um, so let's, uh, at least it triggers that we need to have this conversation. It's an important conversation to have. Um, and that's a way I think uh, I see other visuals. The other one is that um, and still it's for a limited number of people so we're still trying to develop uh, this feature film and bring into film festivals and so on just to make noise um, to make as much noise as we can so that people that have absolutely no clue that this is something important can see it in some of their feeds of information mm -hmm. um, yeah. i see it kind of a seed you plan to see it might not resonate at that point, but maybe later it starts growing up. Like, for example, when I watched the La Educación Prohibida, no? the Forbidden Education, that happens when I was at university. Five years later, or maybe six, actually, I came back to it and it was like, this was so true. Like, mm -hmm. let's check it out again. And then I started going into it and, and seeing other things. It, it took maybe six years to actually kind of flourish. And or but that curiosity was there. Mm -hmm. Then once that you have the time, then you can go and do that trip, that, that journey by yourself. You can do it with more people, obviously, but that the, the inner motivation has to come from mm -hmm. you. And that way you are more open to hear other people. But yeah, I think that is a super nice way to trigger conversations. Um, and it brings, like what you said about consuming a lot of things just, just for the fear of missing out. Um, it doesn't bring compromise. So mm -hmm. that's another thing that we would like to work on. Like, how do you bring awareness plus compromise to action? Yeah, because we watch lots of documentary films about everything, like solid regeneration and 
and eating meat and lots of things. And like usually like after we watch a documentary, it's like a week of action, a week of, I need to change the way I consume, I need the way, the, the way I eat. But then it fades away quite quickly uh, unless you are really involved in the topic. So that, that was a, a big question that we had about how do we ensure that this stays beyond the conversation that we have afterwards. Mm -hmm. uh, and just, uh, um, yeah, just uh, another um, one, we, just to finish the topic of the, um, of sure. the audiovisual, another uh, forum where I think that we need to bring this audiovisual is to those indigenous communities. Um, because when thinking about how to, um, how to balance right the local uh, wisdom with how the world is evolving um, my natural reaction will be let's ask them let's put the responsibility back in their hands but i think that the, the influence of hollywood the influence of uh, marketing the influence of everything is so strong that it even for indigenous people it's very easy to say of course i want my children to go to university in the big city of course, uh, I want all the, to have the big sofa and the big uh, TV screen and all those things uh, because of the influence is so strong um, uh, and it's just one sided. So I think with these documentary films, we can bring another side of the story into the conversation and, and then definitely bring that decision back to them of how the, wh what they want to do in their communities. Yeah, Andrew. Yes, thank you, everyone. And uh, sorry to take up time. I, I, I really enjoyed the film and I really enjoyed the discussion and uh, very um, lot lots to think about uh, and and uh, and to, to process from this. Um, like you, Michelle, I'm I'm on the fringes of university and uh, uh, sort of inside and outside. So I have this sort of uh, uh, um, rather strange relationship with uh, an institution that is that is based around logical positivism and and all of those things we've been talking about yeah i don't don't share that particular philosophy uh, of learning um i just want to share with you that you know in terms of you know green shoots and how you know how we uh, i think you were talking about balance uh, and, and how we kind of maintain that balance and i think um uh I kind of you're also talking about how do we find this third way and so we we don't leave um local and indigenous communities completely isolated and at the mercy of mining companies or tech companies or whoever it is who wants to come in and, and take what they have including you know music who's a big factor i mean the exploitation around music and and images and so on um the um so i think i think there's the question is how to how to change the the, the global debate around this so, you know we, we might want to preserve and keep protected or um, keep safe local and indigenous communities but in this in in, in my, my fear is that we'll be overwhelmed by that but there'll be powerful forces that simply won't allow that to happen on one hand but also there's a need to um, take the wisdom and reinvent education and uh, to do that, and I just want to share with you, I'm, I'm actually a, a part-time psychotherapist. So I'm, I, and I, we've actually got the first um, eco uh, psychotherapy course uh, um, licensed in the UK. So this July, I'll be completing um, as as, a, as an eco therapist. So actually, using nature as part of the therapeutic process, which is um, shouldn't be that controversial, but is in fact deeply controversial and conflicted in the psychotherapy industry because we, you know, still largely takes place behind closed doors inside a building so um and if, you know so there's, there's there's a lot going on but in that um psychotherapy course, we do draw upon um a lot of the insights from you know indigenous communities around the world particularly things like rites of passage and um some of the um the, the thinking and awareness of language is very important um yes yeah, symbolic um you know symbols uh is is very important so we, we are enriching the therapeutic process hopefully so i just wanted to share that it's not it's not all um it, it, it there's not necessarily a clear polarization i think there are opportunities to reinvent even very conservative uh restrictive educational institutions and hierarchies and so on and that and that's really the big challenge we've got sorry to take up too much time i know we've got you know this Thank you.
thanks for all of you. We really enjoyed it. <laughs> Thank you, Andrew. That's awesome, Andrew. And, and I, I would love to learn more about it. So we'll reconnect afterwards. Yeah, yeah. I've joined. I've signed up, by the way, as, as you were talking. So. Uh, Love, love to be part of this and and learn, learning loads. So thank you, thank you. <laughs> cool. Something else? Eagles. Yep. Michelle. Michelle. Since the <laughs> attentive hand. <laughs> yeah. <It's> like <laughs> Michelle is in contemplation. Should I? Should I? Sorry, I, I'm in contemplation. Sorry, but I just. <laughs> say one thing about when uh, David when you David when you said about um, the this whole idea of measures that um, many of the you know the projects and the the spaces in the sort of formal is about like what you can measure and the indicators so so my one foot in the university is working on a German funded project <laughs> on just energy transition so I'm I'm like, oh my God, I'm back in that reports of like measuring mm -hmm. <laughs> and indicators. But um, um, but I, I I just see that they 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 that money as reparations. So I kind of ignore them a lot and do, do, do different things. Um, but um, but yeah, my point was so there there are few of us like minded in the university are working through questions of decoloniality and relationality, and um, and uh, we, which was my my friend and colleague, we put a, a, a proposal together on um, relearning relationality on the land of the land on which the university stands for the sustainability projects that's happening. And although we reached the top five in the, but in the end we didn't get the funding. But I thought of that when you said I thought exactly that because they can't measure the conversations we're going to have about land and stolen land on the university and and yeah what it means to connect with the ancestors and um shift our relationships to land um so so that's 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 also just an interesting moment in this also i don't know this time in the world of like you know indicators and sdgs and 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 if you're not in that frame of proposal writing yeah I, you know you're not going to get the money and then one must think how do you camouflage to do the work you want to do but you know get the money so yeah but I but I just wanted to say that was an in, in, in interesting point about like measurement in this in this space at the moment cool thank you uh, thank you very much I think yes we have two more minutes so yes to just, conclude sorry. I will let yes. I, I'm just gonna sorry 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 for jumping in. Um, Camilo and I are actually have some roles in the next session, so we actually have to jump off right now. Um, but thank you so much. Um, I'll leave you as a host, so you can go on a little bit longer if you need to. Um, okay. But yeah, I really really appreciated this and everyone's input. Um, and yeah, I'll see you at the next next session. This room is open, Sierra, for them to stay for a while. No? Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, you can stay for as long as you want here. This room, so you can stay. <laughs> talking if you want. Thank you very much for- Thank you so making, much, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thank, thank you. you conversations thank you. and mm -hmm. like, that's that's evolving audiovisual. So thank you very <laughs> much. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Cool. I was- I, Yeah. Oh, then no, no, go to, ahead, go ahead. Wants to, yeah, Archana, if you want to go. I basically just, because a couple of things I just wanted to cover because, uh, the question that Michelle also asked some time back. And one of the things I have learned over a period of time is that if we diffuse the situation, if we take away the seriousness of the topic while maintaining the integrity of the topic, it allows that conversation to flow more freely and nobody ends up getting defending. A lot of time people feel that they need to protect and defend that thing, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and the moment we diffuse, so I started a platform called Academy of Failure. And the concept was to talk about failure. And you're saying, okay, so what are we learning from our failures, right? And why failure is essential? Because there is such a sting to failures, right? And we as society don't allow it. We don't accept it. We don't want to live with it. And that is just not something, uh, I don't think it's a healthy thing for our 
world as a whole right now if we do not look at such a important emotional element uh, that can become the driving force failure does not mean that you're not good enough it just means that this is not the way you need to do it and there are multiple other ways to explore right it means that you learn something from here and how can you apply it somewhere else so many different dimensions of looking at it but the moment we we go from the perspective and i've realized that because uh, uh, michelle i have i used to take a lot of talks in colleges and teach kids so the kids loved it but the management did not and it would be fun right because at the end of the day i did not follow anything in the syllabus because i was coming from a lived experience of having learned something applied it in my company and then found success with it so i would teach from that lens so i realized that balances are important because at the end of the day the people who created an institution are also conditioned you know across their own narratives and we can't fault them for that but what can i do to invite them in the conversation that also allows them to look at another perspective to say that disagreement and dissent does not mean disrespect to you but it creates a space for a conversation for everybody no something to that effect so i think that is one very important thing second uh, david what you was talking about bringing in the indigenous community to share the stories from their narrative and that is a very essential part of the work we do uh, coincidentally we are starting a storytelling workshop from tomorrow for the next two weeks across all the three tribes in the state i am and we are inviting the community elders and the kids and everybody with lot of drawing material so we we will share narratives and then they have to tell the stories and then we start sketching and drawing everything is from their lens these will be then converted into story books and then these will go into primary schools and everywhere where these stories are written by the community people drawn by the kids and all we are doing is bringing it together so it's a project that we are doing for the government and we are working on something like that so it's it's beautiful i would love to share you know once we are through with the books the, then those narratives i would definitely love to share but yes telling the story from the lens of the indigenous people and not corrupting their narrative by bringing in our lens is very very important because at the end of the day um from how you explain something to me taking the same thing forward will also have my narrative added to it and it would have already somewhere changed it a bit right it can be a positive thing but when i'm looking at creating a space for uh, the wisdom of an elder i want it to come in its purest form and probably how a younger person from the community looks at it rather than somebody who comes from a very urbanized uh, lens and you know tries to look at it from their own perspective and represent it from their perspective but it would have already changed the essence of it no and i think that's very very important over there so yeah just those two things i wanted to share thank you thank you arshana yeah no definitely i mean there are so many things there that that we can do to start those conversations and 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 precisely that also asking questions from curiosity no so we we start that conversation and like oh what are your fears and what do you think and that way we get to understand the other person and figure out a way in which everybody is learning and, and there is a space for the differences because we don't want also like only one way we want many different ways so yeah having that possibility to to have those conversations without without a grown or bad with a, a good or bad answer is is essential and i really like what you said arjuna about the mistakes that's one of the things that we do in the learning expedition is like hey mistakes are part of the learning process it's like if you don't make mistakes i mean you don't learn so much because it's part of like falling and trying to figure out a different way and like from but it's it's true like it's a it's a word loaded with so many bad connotations it means that oh i i, I have fail forever and it's not it's like okay you just at this moment you didn't get it yet <laughs> but then it can keep evolving and you can keep um seeing mm -hmm. things how it goes i would like to well it, do you want to say anything else or should we conclude or mm -hmm. it feels like yeah we already went through beyond the time but uh, but if anyone else would like to share something yeah Cool. Because I was, I was, I wanted to go back to what so we said at the beginning. Like, you were talking about different levels of connection, no? like connecting with ourselves, connecting with others, and connecting with with nature. And like, there has been this lately. There has been this tendency of, oh, we have to pay a lot of attention to our emotions and to our needs and so on. And those 
you, you said it, the, the instinct to stay together and the alliance is gone. And that for me was like, push, because I have noticed also how that connection between different people is broken, but the same with nature. So like in that scale, we have prioritized the connection with ourselves and forgot about the connection with others and the connection with nature. And if we go back and think how we actually evolved, it was actually being connected to that nature, nature. that instinct of how to live in nature was essential to survive. And then actually to be able to, uh, I don't know, how do you say, hunt, hunt, to hunt and so on, you needed to collaborate with other people. If not, <laughs> how, do you, how were you going to be able to do it? So like prioritizing or going back to that nature and to collaborate with other people is super essential. And we can, and it's for us as human beings, we, 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 we collaborate, we, we, we need to belong and we need to, to work together. So I would like to, to bring back the awareness to the importance of nature and connection to others. And mentioning Gustavo Esteban, one of the interviews that actually Sierra uh, recommended, that is also in the page, there is an interview with, with, with Gustavo Esteban. And one other sentence that shocked me, it was like, um, they were talking about these indigenous communities and everybody joining together and they were forming an assembly. So he said, like, together we are an assembly, but when we each of us go to their different places, we are a network. And that it's beautiful because it's like we can still keep our inner self, like our identity as communities. And when we are together, we can also create new things and we can keep co-learning and learning from each other as well. So that it has been in the back of my mind, that sentence all the time. We are assembly and we are network. And that's beautiful also to have this opportunity mm -hmm. to connect with everyone in yeah. the coercity. Yeah, and this event, I think, is one of those ways in which we um, create those new connections that can keep on going forward. So I'm, I'm really glad that I'm already connected with some of the people in this call. And, and hopefully these are new seats for new things that are about to happen. Mm -hmm. Yep. <laughs> yeah. Civic? Civic. Hi, uh, where did you find that uh, interview with Gustavo Esteva? Let me copy it for you. I think Sierra put it. So. Yeah, that's it. There you go. So we're going to share this one. And then um, I think we're closing now this space so that we can join the next session about connecting to, to Mother Earth, I think it is, uh, with uh, with Jejo, who is another person that you have seen. I, I, don't, I don't know if he was in yeah, that yeah, film. Yeah, of course. He was, right? he he's in many of he's our... He's like so... saying, pukush, pukush, pukush. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's pretty clear with his message. <laughs> so let's go on and enjoy him then. Thank See you very much, bit. everyone, for joining. Oh, thank, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for having us. Bye. 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 Bye.